Our next presenter is um, David Seeley with Johnson Engineering, and he'll be presenting the restoration of tape grass in the freshwater of the Hatchie River. Yeah, my name is David Seeley. Um, just recently joined Johnson Engineering, and I want to thank them for allowing me the opportunity to come present today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today goes back many years, about 12 years. It's a story I'd like to tell you about tape grass and the Lucas Hedge and Estuary. And it's, it's not a, a necessarily a happy story. Um, some of this work was initiated at the Conservancy of Southwest Florida, and then it was continued at GCU. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Wynn Everton, one of the founding faculty at GCU as well. Was, major part of this study. Uh, two students of mine, also John Ferlita and Corey Ross. Uh, Corey's doing his master's thesis on this project. And the project would not have been uh, possible if it weren't for Beth Orlando from the Water Management District and also Peter Durin. Um, ecosystem services. This is something I put together for a workshop recently, the Blue Sketchy Science Workshop. And a lot of one is habitat. Fishes, crabs, gray fish, bivalves, epiphytes, you name it all kinds of aquatic insects as well. Uh, provides forage for the endangered manatee. And a lot of people forget this. Um, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. But also waterfowl, freshwater turtles, crayfish, and snails. Um, one of the other services that provides is stabilizes sediments. Uh, Rick Harlison touched on this quite a bit earlier. Um, and because it is an Olympic hailing SAV, or freshwater seagrass, if there is such a thing, uh, it, it also stabilizes, it attenuates wave action, stabilizes sediments, removes nutrients, and improves water clarity. And that has cascading effects all the way through the system. Um, tape grass is interesting because it occurs all the way up to Canada. And down all the way, we found it as far south as Marco, almost Marco Island area, down uh, in the Rookery Bay area, in our artificial pond down there. Um, we have various strains of Palestinian. Um, it's found in the uh, streams and runs of North Florida, all the way down, like I said, to the Kusihachi on the right hand side of your screen there. Very ubiquitous and fairly tolerant, but it has its limits, as we'll see. I'm going to skip through this. It's tolerant of looking at hailing conditions up to about 10 parts per thousand. Then things start to go south. And uh, Peter Durian and Bob Chamberlain have done a tremendous amount of work on this. I just want to tip my hat to them for a lot of the groundbreaking work that's been done in the Blue Sagi system. Um, it, was value, it was a valued ecosystem component in the CERP models. Uh, Tom Barnes did her PhD on this. Uh, so it was the foundation of the, the Blue Sagi estuary model, going back to 2005. It covered over a thousand acres of the Blue Sagi estuary. I'll show you a map of that in a minute. Uh, and this is based on Hoffacker's work back in the 90s. Uh, it is sensitive to anthropogenic disturbances, and we'll talk about that. The good news is it can respond very quickly. I'll give you an example where we've been able to restore large acreages of seagrass, tape grass. Um, again, salinity levels, it has its limits. Number two, water clarity. Uh, Steve Bortone and Bob Turpin looked at this, and they found that salinity is not the only limiting factor. Sea dump or uh, color can also inhibit growth. And Areas that even have higher salinity, you can have. Hello. <laughs> okay. Uh, but anyway, light is a limiting factor. Color can have a huge impact. Uh, sediment type, Dr. Lynn Geddes and Bill Howard at UF, uh, colleagues of mine, and, and I could like to consider friends, have looked at various genetic strains from the Fish and Wildlife Commission. And they looked at sediment and, and nutrient levels in there which species might be more tolerant of a polluted system, and they've identified a couple of strains. In fact, they've identified strains. Each lake that they've looked at seems to have its unique genetic signature. So there's a number of different strains in South Florida. Um, we have found more recently in 2002 that herbivory is a real, real problem. Uh, several studies have been done, including a study that was done in Chesapeake Bay by Ken Moore and his colleagues, and they have published this in Restoration Ecology just recently. Herbivory is the limiting factor in the Chesapeake Bay system. They recommend putting out these large explosions, very large explosions, what they call founder colonies, to get the seabeds established. Um, this map is adapted from Hoffacker's work in 94. 
and it's re-digitized by one of our graduate students at MGCU, Daniel Dickinson. And Daniel took the effort to hear, I wish he would have used different colors, but what you see in the red there were dense tape grass beds. And in the purple, uh, those are moderately dense grass beds, and the blue, the lighter blue color, are scattered grass beds. And all of this, all of it is gone. I haven't heard anybody talking about this in these other talks, and I was very disappointed that it hasn't gotten more attention, so I'm not sounding the alarm. This is all gone, and we need to do something to bring it back. But again, the endangered manatees forage on this, especially during the wintertime when they're attracted to the FPNL discharge of the Orange River. This thermal discharge is their thermal refugia in the winter. They have nothing to eat in the winter. They have to travel downstream, or they have to browse in the banks. Um, this is taken from James Douglas's work. This was a system status report for the Water Management District that just came out in the fall last year. And what I want to point out to you, if I don't break my neck here, is on the top we have salinity spikes. So you can see this. This is actually Valsterium. Excuse me. This is actually when Valsterium beds were very, very dense, following a very long rainy period. We had dense valve beds in the middle of the Kusihachi near the 41 bridges. What's the site known as uh, Lusahatchee uh, River Estuary Site 2? Um, we see when the releases in 2000, 2001 were cut off, we had high salinity spike, and that corresponds to a decline in tape grass beds. Tape grass beds suffered for a number of years, and then they started to come back in 05 and 06 when we had a period of low salinity up here. Great grass beds recovered. Now we don't know if this is from seed bed or from tubers, but we had this recovery and then flatlined. We had this little blip in 2011 and it's been gone ever since. Now, what I want to point out here these blue bars are actually, uh, these are studies that were done. The first blue bar on the left is a study that was done in 2002 in August through 2003, and it was done in the tidal portions of the Kusahatchee. And what we found was that the grass was growing just fine, but it was being raised upon very heavily. Let's turn that off down. Anyway, I'm going to yell. Um, but the story, the story here is basically that we have disturbed the system initially by, thank you, by solidity disturbance. And then the herbivores came to the salad bar, and the salad bar was empty. So uh, we found that herbivory is regulating the recovery. Try another one. Thank you, Lisa. Let's try this. Okay. All right, moving along. Uh, we found very quickly that exposures were required. Out. This is an example of one of the exposures that was tested in 2002 and again in, in Lake Trapper in 2008. Um, we, in 2009, I tested two different exposures, and uh, what we found was that both of them worked very well at, at preventing herbivores from grazing into the ground. We tried to discuss square cloak exposure, and it's a terrible echo. Anyway, this is an exposure cage that was put out for two years. If you zoom in on this, hopefully you can see this. Two years after this was put out, we have tape grass surviving inside the plastic exposure. Nowhere outside of that cage were there any tape grass. Um, flash backward to Lake Trafford. 2008, we had a low water period. We planted 30 of these cages in Lake Trafford. Now we have about 73 acres of tape grass in Lake Trafford. Now, why is it? Why don't we need to protect them out there? This is the 73 acres that we just mapped last May, February through April, actually. So we've got these dense grass beds, and it's continuing to flourish. Um, one reason I suspect that tape grass is doing very well is because of this fellow right here. Alligators eat sea turtles, or freshwater turtles, probably eat sea turtles too if they can, but they eat a lot of freshwater turtles. Freshwater turtles love that. Um, another thing we found, I'm getting ahead of myself, alligators also like to eat apple snails, especially when they're small. Alligators three to four feet love to eat apple snails and crayfish. 
Just a quick slide here to give credit to Cecil Leslie and his group who's helped us. Uh, Lake Trafford is now our donor site for tape grass restoration projects. Um, fast forward, the Kusanchi River tape grass restoration study funded by the Water Management District in 2011. They had a small amount of money. They called us up and said, can you do something with this? I said, absolutely. So Beth and her colleagues went out <clears throat> and we wanted to establish an upstream Fresh water upstream of the Franklin Locks, uh, the Dallas area, and Americana Sea Pit. We wanted to evaluate planting densities. Do we need to plant really dense beds or can we plant just 10 plants per meter? Uh, so that was tested as well. We also wanted to evaluate two different genetic strains. Remember, I was talking about all these different genetic strains. We have two local strains we wanted to test. And we wanted to compare a couple of different sites. This is the study design that was used as the basis of Corey Ross's thesis. So what we have here, two sites, two densities, high and low, high and low, two genetic strains. So we got these replicates. Two sites, two densities, and two different genetic strains. These are the sites in the river that we looked at, one to the left just above the locks in kind of a protected oxbow area. And this is an area that had been studied before by SCCF and seagrass recovery with some success, I might add. Um, and also an upstream site that's more exposed, it's getting more sunlight, it's more of a hard bottom. Um, these are the cages, real quick, I'm going to flip through these. These are the cages that we used, and you notice that they have long legs. We sink those legs into the sediment, pound them in as far as we can, and try to anchor the bottom to prevent the river horse from getting underneath. This is how they look, deployed in the field, and this is Corey Ross checking the cages. And in this case, he's actually checking for these rascals. This is the Pomacian solarum, the island apple snail. It's a recent invader of the Cosiatra system, and we're not sure exactly when it showed up, but we think it's been about 10 to 12 years. And uh, it is grazing on the tape grass, and it's getting into the cages when it's very little. If you see this, this is also on Beth's poster out there across the hallway. This is a small apple snail. It gets through this mesh, and it grows up, protected from predators inside the cages. So we figured out a way around this. We took the tops off the cages so the lambkins and the snail pits can come in and feed on them. And it seemed to help, actually. Um, well, we've learned quite a bit. Now, my whole message is we've learned a lot about tape grass restoration in the system. Uh, we, we wanted to scale this up, so phase two of the project was let's put some bigger cages out. Let's see if bigger cages are better. And in some ways they work, and in some ways they weren't. Um, these are the six meter by two meter cages in the upper left hand corner up here. And this is how they are deployed in the field, all four sites. Put out in, uh, I believe it was May and June 2012, and we monitored them for six months. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's some very large vessels in the system. They put out three, four, five foot wakes, and we've had our, our junk boat flipped to almost upside down. Um, and so, what you see here is a damaged cage. We go out and we fix them. So, this went on for about six months. The cages get damaged, and we fix them. Um, we even had a manatee come and barge into one of our cages and actually move the cage. You can see the grazing pattern. They chew them kind of like celery, so it's kind of a rough chew pattern. You can kind of tell by the chew pattern what's eating them. Turtles have a nice circular bite. Uh, manatees have a kind of chewed off, like I said, a celery type bite. Anyway, bottom line, at the end of six months, we found both the small cages and the large cages provided dense, lush tape grass. And the important thing here is with those small, low circular cages, the plants cannot reach sexual maturity. This is a dioecious plant. Male plants and female plants, they both have to produce flowers. And the female plants typically have to get about 30 to 36 inches high before they can produce the seed pods. So this is critical. Those low cages don't allow that. The larger cages, the taller cages will allow that. Um, some water quality data, basically what I wanted to show you, the upstream of the locks. Salinity stayed quite low throughout the study. Second depths were not great. We had like 0.5 meters up to just around 1.3 meters. But good, you know, it's a resilient plant. It can handle that. Um, some quick results. After three months, the large cages, we found tremendous amount of coverage. 
both Lake Kennedy and Lake Trafford streams, 100% covered. 94%, 98%, 96, 100, 96, 93, 96. And so these are shoots per meter square, 119 shoots per meter square, 36, 92, 56. This is really good coverage, even with those snails that are raising on the plants. Um, it's very promising. Um, my conclusions are that herbivory is the controlling factor, both upstream of rocks, and in times like now, downstream of the rocks, even though we have plenty of fresh water, we suspect that the seed bank has been wiped out from 10 years of salinity perturbations and excessive herbivory. Um, this plant has what they call late dormancy. The seeds can lay dormant for years, years, and years. But if it gets a small signal that things are good, it shoots, you know, sends a shoot out and it sprouts, and then it gets uh, hit with salinity, then it kills it. And so going back to that graph, you see things gradually went downhill. We suspect that the seed bank has been wiped out below the Franklin box. <clears throat> I mentioned Ken Moore's work up in, and he found the same thing, that using mesh exposures to protect plants is critical to restoration success. And they have gone ahead and put out these large founder colonies, areas the size of this room larger, to protect grass beds from excessive herbivory to get that seed bed reestablished. Um, exposure cages, like I said before, large and small, allow for seed production. We need a better cage, though. We need something stronger. Um, the Allison outside the cage was raised down to short little nubs, two or three centimeters long, and in some cases, uh, down to virtually nothing. We saw no seed, uh, no flowering or seed production outside the cages. And uh, finally, the growth habit of the two streams differed. Lake Trafford tend to produce longer blades, wider blades, more robust plants. Lake Kennedy produced a lot of smaller plants. So in some cases, you may want to prefer one strain over the other. Or like some limiting, I would go with the Lake Trafford strain, which produces the longer blades, and you can get up there to reach the light, to get closer to the surface. Uh, a number of recommendations. I'm going to skip over this for the right to questions. Hopefully you'll have a couple of questions for me. I, I know that I do have a number of people to acknowledge. But go ahead. Thanks, Bill Bowles. Phylaxia. It's, it's 
It's very much like turtle grass. It looks like turtle grass. Um, and it provides the same type of habitat and benefits in the upper edge All right, thank you. Thank you. One more question, I'm sorry. Um, what, did you ever go back and check out what happened after you removed the cages? Did that grass get decimated or what happened? Yes and no. The very first slide that I showed it is actually you know, an area where we removed the cage upstream of the locks. I'm sorry to go through this. I guess there's probably a quicker way to do this, but what you see here behind this slide on the right, this this is a bed where we removed a circular cage. This these blades are very short, they're about six to eight inches long. But it did produce a very dense grass bed. Now this is too shallow for manatees to get in there. Um, and this is upstream blocks where we have fewer manatees to start with. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you.